What's up, guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be fooling around with the sequel to a title that we covered several times over the last couple of years uh, by Arthur Smierowski, uh, Soul Ash 2. The original Soul Ash was a very original RPG. I liked it a lot. Some people couldn't get into it, but I always describe the first Soul Lash as like the ultimate murder hobo RPG. It effectively frees you of any of the constraints of things that you normally need to do in RPGs right at the beginning, and is one of the only RPGs ever made that encourages you to kill everyone, every quest giver, every blacksmith, uh, because you're an evil overlord that's consuming souls to, like, rise up and become powerful and conquer the earth, and over time you effectively become like a god. Soul Ash 2 does not continue in those footsteps. So Soul Ash 2 is a much more structured survival RPG. The best thing that I know how to compare it to would probably be something along the lines of, like, Neo Scavenger, but medieval. Or, I, I think the closer comparison that you could draw for it is something like the adventure mode for Dwarf Fortress. This is a game that's going to generate an entire world. That entire world is going to have, like, a history, like, diplomacy in between nations and, like, states and stuff like that. And then in this game, you're not the hero. You're just some guy that exists inside that world. If you want to make a living and feed yourself by being a blacksmith, go be a blacksmith. If you want to go on adventures and slay wolves and solve problems for people, go do that. But ultimately, this is intended to be much more of kind of like a, a sandbox for you to fool around inside of and do whatever you want. So we're going to take a look at this demo here today for about 30 minutes, see if it's something you wanted to add to your wish list or otherwise pass on. If after watching this, you wanted to get the game for yourself, you can absolutely do that. I got a link for you down below in the description. And then, of course, on top of that, I also have a link down there to my Twitch stream and my Discord, just in case you wanted to hang out live. So the first thing we need to do if we want to jump on into this thing, I like that map right there. We need to create a world. We will name this world Ass Planet because that's a great name for it. And so now it's going to generate rate like a hundred years worth of history roads trade lanes things like that are going to happen um, you can also make this take a lot longer and so you can make a much more developed sort of like mature world but we'll go with the default one for right now apparently we're a hundred years into the progress of this society right now now let's go ahead and continue there's three different modes you can play on there's basically high fantasy which is like softcore mode uh, this allows you to play like a normal life like you would in any other game. You're the main character. So like when you die, you respawn. Your character doesn't age. You can't die from starvation or dehydration. It's basically like the gloves off or the gloves on mode. Uh, this is the normal mode right here, dark fantasy. This is permadeath. So this game is a roguelike. And so there's the permadeath right there. And then, of course, there is hard core. So there you go. When you die, the entire world ends. So in this game, whenever your character dies, the world kind of like ages and becomes more mature so that you can live through the eons and whatnot. Kind of interesting stuff. I dig it. Uh, let's go ahead and try to make our character here. There's a lot of character customization you can do. I don't feel like doing it, so I'm just going to kind of like wait until I find a character that kind of looks like what I want to look like. At the moment, there's five races inside of this demo. This is a pretty chunky demo for a developer. Honestly, I think they deserve kudos because this is a very, very generous demo there's a lot of stuff to do inside of this demo like you can tell the game is early on but they basically give you access to like all of it and as new skills come out they just add new skills to the game and stuff like that too and so it's a little bit wild in that regard uh we'll go with this guy right here he looks good enough to me and then we will be a human you get different stat bonuses and whatnot depending you also actually have a different life cycle as well like elves live like 500 years dwarves live like 200 years so technically your playthrough lasts a lot longer if you play an elf or a dwarf without dying violently than it does if you play any of the lesser races. And so that's kind of interesting. And we also get to pick some skills. And so there's everything from just like generic adventuring, which is like finding your way around and doing kind of like relic checks. Athletics for like running and stuff like that. Different fighting styles, different crafting styles. Not everything is in the game yet, but it will be. At some point, and they've been slowly releasing new skills as the demo gets a little bit deeper and wider. Uh, for right now, I think I'd like to go for mace fighting. I think I'd like to go for armor smithing. And I think I would like to go for... Let's call it protection. We'll be kind of like a fighty guy, I guess. We can pick up these skills whenever we want. I mean, I guess technically we could drop that and pick up pyromancy. 
But there's only like pyro. I think there's like only pyromancy in the game. I think they recently added thievery and like tailoring or something like that. Like one of the recent patches added a couple of trade skills. So, anyways, uh, we get to pick gear from these right hand columns. I'll take the bracer and I'll take the spiked club uh, because it's way better than the hammer. And so we've got a spiked club. We've got some bracers, and then I guess we'll take. We'll go for a wooden shield, I suppose, and then we'll continue the game. Now, at the beginning of the game, you get to pick a society that you're a part of and also a family that you are a part of. If you're a part of a family, I'm not exactly sure how that affects everything. It seems to be an important mechanic. I don't know, like, I don't know exactly what it affects, but it does give you a family that you can, like, go to their house and, like, sleep in their kitchen and stuff like that. Uh, I've mostly just been playing anything that's like an orphan. And so I haven't really been worrying about it too much. There's Hillron. Is that Hillron right there? Let's start out. What about that little village down here? Yeah, let's start out in Hillron. Let's start out there because we're close enough to where we can get around. And so here we are. We are in Hillron Village. And this is what the game looks like. We start out in the village of our choosing, and we start out next to the well. And that's pretty much all we've got going for us. When I told you this was a sandbox game... This is on the further end of sandbox games, kind of like Kenshi. Uh, it's a game that's not really going to give you any quests. It's not going to give you any guidance. It's not going to tell you what to do. You're just a guy in a medieval world, and it's up to you to kind of like forge your own destiny. So let's go ahead and we'll swap in some of our weaponry. We did luckily start out with three breads, which is really nice. Oh, that's a two-handed weapon. Well, I shouldn't have gotten the shield then. I didn't realize the crude spiked club was a two-hander. All right, fair enough. We started out with some abilities. Uh, we can bash an enemy, and so it looks like it deals 100%, so we probably hit for 13 to 19 damage, and it possibly stuns them. We also have a shield slam that's in there because of our protective thing, so we're probably going to want to look into getting a one-hander pretty shortly. Uh, like, what I like to do in this game when I first start on out is I just click this little button up here, and it's going to walk you off to the edge of the screen. Now, I'm going to say right at the front end, I'm not a big fan of the character coins. I, I think, like, so the environments look really, really nice and very stark and very interesting, just like the first game did. Uh, but the character coins, for a game that's all about your character growing and getting older and getting new equipment and changing and going on adventures and accumulating scars... It's not in-depth enough for me, visually anyways. I, I think they should actually have, like, a paper doll that walks around the game world in, like, an animated way, you know what I mean? Like, having just the coins right here, they're very stiff, they're very flat, and it's just not very pretty to look at, in my opinion. Uh, but that might just be a taste thing. We need to, let's just walk on up to the crossroads here. Uh, nothing happened on our way up to the crossroads. So normally what will happen here is you will locate points of interest. There's one right there. Let's go see what it is. Uh, point of interest. What are you? It's nighttime right now, so our line of sight is going to be really, really terrible. All right, I slept in morning so we can actually, like, see, because at night our line of sight gets really, really terrible. It looks like our point of interest is up here to the top left, so we're going to go ahead and check that out. Points of interest can really be anything. They can be attacked caravans. They can be quest givers. They can be like a pack of wolves. They can be like a spider's den. It can be a cave that you can go down into and mine precious ores. There's all kinds of little things you can do in this game. And we do have a bunch of wolves over here. We'll want to be careful about how we aggro these. But it is going to be pretty important for us to kind of like get stronger. So I'm going to bash that guy right there for 13. We hit him for 8. And as you can see, the game, you just click on stuff. And then like it falls over and dies. We are taking a little bit of attrition here in this battle. So we're going to want to fall back for just a second. Because it looks like there's like two or three more wolves behind us. It's hard to say. Just one. I think we can handle one as long as we use our abilities smartly. There we go. We'll keep on crushing him with the hammer. And there goes another wolf. Now, this game uses Bethesda-style level ups. Uh, you do not level up in this game from getting XP points or anything else like that. You only get XP in this game uh, from doing the activity. So if I hit a guy in the face with a mace... I get better at hitting guys in the face with a mace. Uh, it sounds it sounds like it's not that complicated, but you just got to bring it up because people care about this stuff. The progression mechanisms matter inside titles like this. Top left-hand corner, you've got a number of meters. If you've ever played the first Soul Ash game, you will be familiar with them, but I'll go through them real fast so that you know what's happening contextually on screen right now. Uh, so you've got your health, you've got your stamina, 
The orange portion is how tired you are. It only goes away from sleeping. Uh, we've got ourselves our hunger meter. Next to that is how much food we have inside of our inventory, so how many points worth of food we can fill back up on the meter. Same thing down here with water. There are multiple levels of dehydration and starvation. Uh, you don't die instantly when it gets down to zero. You don't start losing health or anything instantly when it gets down to zero. Uh, but you do get dehydration levels, and eventually your character will no longer be able to do things that he would normally be able to do, like fast travel and whatnot, if it gets too high. And then I assume at some point you probably die from it, but I've never gotten there myself personally. Uh, let's keep crushing this wolf right here. And we didn't do too bad of a job. Now, the ultimate goal here is the game's got a little bit of Ubisoft syndrome going on. Uh, really, the only thing to do in the demo as of right now is, like, craft stuff, build stuff, get stronger. And then from there, hit points of interest. And the points of interest are kind of like the points of interest you would expect from, like, a Ubisoft game. Like I said, you go there. Uh, there's usually, like, a chest or, like, a thing you need to investigate. You're probably going to need to fight a bunch of stuff before you can click on the investigatable thing. It will give you loot. Uh, you will get, like, adventuring experience or something, and then you will go on to your next adventure, kind of wandering around the hinterland. Uh, and that's kind of like the core gameplay loop for right now. It took me a minute to figure out, like, what the game was going for when I first got sent the demo, because I was kind of just, like, wandering around aimlessly, and I wasn't exactly sure what to do with myself. Uh, there's someone from the caravan that survived right here. His name is Manfield, and he's a 101-year- he's a 101-year-old human? You look great, man. You look fantastic. Uh, they came out of nowhere. Before anybody could do anything, we were under attack. I just want to go home now. You've unlocked the Manfield family in your knowledge screen. All right. I guess he doesn't have any particular things. Oh, I picked up a human arm. I thought it was a glove. It's a weapon, so I can beat a guy to death with somebody else's hand. Gotcha. Well, let's just throw that on the ground because it's a little tiny bit icky. Uh, if you want to know what something is, you can hold down shift, and it's going to put you into investigate mode. Uh, because sometimes the little sprites and whatnot, it can be kind of hard to figure it out. There's our treasure chest right there. That is ultimately our goal that we're going for. Let's hit it. Uh, we got a crude paralyzing dart, and we got a hag root, which appears to be some kind of magical ingredient. It has mystical properties. Uh, that's probably useful for crafting, would be my guess. Uh, because a lot of the things that you craft in this game, they have like a magical augment slot when you do the crafting system uh, that it gives you strange effects and things on your weapons, sort of Diablo style. So if you wanted to get like, if you wanted to get bonus dexterity on your battle hammer or whatever, you know, you have to figure out what root does that. Or if you wanted to have like fire damage or something, you would have to figure that out as well. For right now, I'm going to make my way to the edge of the map. We need to find some more adventures. We need to find some more things to do. If you're having trouble in this game getting started and figuring out what to do first, my suggestion is find a town that has a hunter or find a town that has a tavern. If you go to a tavern and you go to a hunter, you can ask them about rumors, and those rumors will put little question marks all over your map, which will be like little points of interest that you can check out. So honestly, our first goal is, now that we're back inside this city, it looks like they have a wheat farm, but they don't have a miller, but they do have a tavern, so that's good. Let's see if we can track down the tavern. Oh, we need to buy food, so I'm going to have to sell this shield, and we're going to have to kind of like move along. Best way to find the tavern is just to ask somebody for directions, and so you ask where the tavern's at, and quality of life right there, it's going to ping it on your mini-map, and you can head on over that way. Line of sight is a little bit weird in this game. Um, your character likes to walk backwards and stuff all the time. It's gonna need some work. Like, I don't think it's bad, but I've noticed that I've walked through, like, entire maps backwards. And sometimes you have to, like, consciously get your character to, like, pick a facing. I think it goes a little bit better. This game, so if you play with the mouse, your character's gonna be walking backwards and doing weird stuff a lot of the time. And the line of sight could be a little bit weird. If you play with Wasp, the controls are actually identical to Unreal World. Uh, which is another fantastic free roguelike, by the way, if you've never played it before. I cannot recommend uh, Unreal World enough. Really fascinating game if you can get around the learning curve. I think we just gotta wait for somebody to come back over here. We have a forager over here. Technically, I could buy stuff from the forager. I stole a barrel out of somebody's house. I'll probably just sell the hag root. I'll probably honestly sell everything over here because we need to get some baseline cash flow. Uh, just to, like, feed ourselves and be like a functioning adult, basically. Unfortunately, raspberries are very expensive. Wow, vendor, you're pricey. 
You must have a shortage or something. All right, we may have to go out foraging to find a food supply. But we've got 78 food now. So our first adventure served to fill up our stomach. And what more can you ask for? There's nobody in the tavern right now. I was going to try to buy meat or something from them. Alas, there was no one to sell meat. And so we've got a caravan over there. Let's go ahead and leave this region. And I'll probably just stair-step it to the left. We'll just, like, enter some regions, sleep till morning, and I'm going to forage up some food, I think. All right, well, in wandering, I was tremendously unsuccessful at foraging. I can't express to you how unsuccessful we were. I've been walking around for about eight or nine minutes now on different maps. Not a single bush to harvest, not a single thing to eat. But we got four blueberries right there, which is good. So that'll get rid of some of our hunger. I've also got a rabbit corpse inside of here that I would very much like to dissect. But unfortunately, at the beginning of the game, you don't start out with much. Hey, blueberries, dude. Hell yeah, let's get our blueberry. I see blueberry bushes everywhere. This actually fixes so many things for me. All right, we got 35 food blueberries everywhere, dude. Nice. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, we found an owl folk village. Uh, in this game, you're going to find, like, folk that are not, like, humans or dwarves or anything else. You're, you're mostly just going to murder them all. I don't really know what else to tell you. Uh, this game does retain a little bit of the murder hobo energy from the previous title. In that, like, everything that doesn't kind of look like a human is probably not a nice guy. Uh, enemies drop all their loot in this game if they have loot. So there you go. He had some cloth rags on. Uh, looks like he's got a little owl house over here, too. Oh, a little upstairs area as well. What you got going on? Oh, it's like a little owl tower. Oh, yeah. He's got, like, a little sleeping spot over here, too. So looks like he's got, like, a platform or, like, a balcony or something. I'm going to sleep in his bed for dominance. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. His bed has been slept in for dominance. Let's head back down to the bottom floor and see what we got going on here. There's got to be a few more of them around. Sometimes line of sight will freak out like that right there. It's definitely very, very clear that they have not figured out line of sight entirely in this demo. Because, like, there's an overhang right here. And yet, when I'm standing on this side, the overhang is blocking my line of sight to the left. Even though, technically, this is a vacuous space underneath, like, a balcony or, like, a bridge. Uh, you'll see stuff like that happen. The line of sight needs a lot of work, like I said. There's our treasure chest. We plunder. We got some hollow bone dust. It will put strength and intelligence on an item that we craft. Very nice. What we need to do in the early game, in all honesty, is we need to find a knife. So that's kind of like your first thing, is that it's kind of hard to get food until you have a knife. And then once you have a knife, you can butcher things much more easily. And you can just kind of, like, eat them on the spot and, like, cook them up over a campfire. There is a building menu in this game as well. For right now, I can only build a campfire. But there are other buildings and things that you can make. Uh, we've also got a crafting menu down here that you can take a look at. With my current knowledge, I can make a breastplate. I can make a helmet. I can make a buckler. Uh, these things do take realistic amounts of time to craft, by the way. I made a breastplate on a, ple on a previous character last night when I was just fooling around with the game to get the basics down. And I think it took like two or three days of blacksmithing to get the breastplate done. I just had to like sit there forever. And while we're on the subject, how do skills work in this game? Well, skills. Pretty simple, actually. Uh, so with the skills menu... You have all of your skills in this list. Your skills level up through usage. And what I like about this game, actually, is that on each level you get something. So, like, for adventuring, you're going to learn how to make torches. You're going to learn how to find points of interest from taverns and innkeepers and hunters and whatnot. If you put in the initial five points, you just get these things by default. But, hey, there you go. Now, we got to level up our... I think we got to level up our adventuring a little bit more. Armor smithing, these little blue guys right here, those are stat points. If you come back over to your character sheet, uh, you have stat points. And so, like, I could technically take that all the way up right there. And now I have 19 strength. Every two points you mouse over these, it'll tell you exactly what they do. I can carry more stuff. I'm better at mace fighting now. I've got way better accuracy. And so that's how the advancement of the game works. And I think if they can get, like, a solid density... I think if they can get a solid density of things inside the game, you know, as far as skills go, just keep developing this out, thinking of everything you could possibly be in medieval times and in a fantasy setting for a job, and just keep that going on down. This could be a game with some seriously, like, robust things uh, that you could do. 
I've scavenged like what may be as close to a felony quantity of blueberries as you can possibly get. And now I'm going back on the road to adventure. Apparently it took me a big chunk of my water to get on over here. Early game considerations that you kind of want to think about. First and foremost, I think the developer needs to make it so like berries and stuff like that give you like a little bit of water too when you eat them. Uh, because what I've found is with the characters that I make, you always want to start with a character that has a water skin. Otherwise you're like supremely limited on how far you can make it into the wilderness uh, while adventuring without running out of water and getting dehydrated. And so it makes sense if, like, ra I mean, even if it was, like, one, like, raspberries, berries, all that kind of stuff, uh, just sort of added one water, even that would help out a little bit. But at the moment, foods don't seem to really give you water. There is only drinking from the river and drinking from the well, as far as I can tell. We found another owl folk village. Owl folk really taking it on the chin right now. Inside there, we've got dates, we've got bug shells, we've got scarab shells. So it looks like those are mostly for crafting. Uh, these guys are obviously not going to be super stoked about the fact that I just looted their community chest. But you know what? When I'm in town, the Monopoly game is always over. Okay. Uh, we'll smack this guy over here. There we go. I should probably be looting these guys too and grabbing all the... It's not much, but I can sell it when I get back to town for something. I was hoping we would run into enemies that would drop a little bit better of loot. Grab that right there. We got a feather on that side. Pick that up. Any more owl men around here that want to get busted up? Oh, cool. I've got a stat point. Nice. I got to rest for a couple turns and just get pummeled because I'm too sleepy to fight. The deer over there, too. I would kill for any of these owl folk to actually have, like, a knife or something on them. But early game considerations to think about. You want a tool. Uh, so that you can, if you don't start out with a tool, so our character kind of started out with like nothingness, uh, but you want to get a tool that supports your job. So like if you're like a carpenter, you need an axe to chop down trees, you know, things like that in order to get going. For us, it would be a pickaxe is what we need to find. So if we could get a pickaxe, we could start mining ores. You'll occasionally see these spots on the map where you can go down into the ground uh, and you can climb down and it'll be a cavern. And inside said cavern, you'll be able to find, like, copper and iron and things like that. And, like, magic crystals you can infuse your gear with. Uh, the second consideration is that you're probably going to want to find a knife somewhere. Uh, anything that has the cutting designator. So different items have a, a thing called cutting on them, which means that you can use them to dissect bodies. So that when I kill deer or, like, I kill a rabbit like the one in my inventory... I can actually, like, butcher it, and I can make that into, like, a usable resource and, like, sell the hides and whatnot. One of the reasons why it's going to be really slow going for, like, our character, as an example, uh, is because we don't have any of those things, and we don't have, like, a family to call on. And so we got to kind of, like, piece it all together ourselves. However, I do feel like in that situation, it does make for a much more interesting adventuring story, if nothing else. Wow, this area is really fertile with food. Mmm, we found... A webbed forest. Okay, we'll want to be careful about this. We can gather the cobwebs, by the way. I don't remember if they do anything. And it looks like they're worth a half a buck. That's actually not terrible. I'll grab it. Yeah, just grab them where you see them. Is there somebody behind? There's a giant spider behind me. Okay, Spoder. Step on in here. Step on in here and get gushed. What does Onslaught do? 18 to 26 physical damage and reduces their stamina. Do it. There we go. That spider got dropped. He had a terrible day. Uh, we need to kill all these spiders before we gas out. I'm also going to grab their spider treasure, by the way. There's a plain eye patch. One thing I would like to see is that your character portrait should reflect what you have on. So our character already has an eye patch, but ideally he would not have an eye patch. And when we put on an eye patch, he would then get an eye patch. You see what I mean? Did he just drink the cow milk? Oh, he did because we were dehydrated. Gotcha. Well, the good news here is it didn't say that we completed the adventuring spot. And that, to me, implies that there's another chest around here somewhere. Kill the wolf. Ooh, spider yarn. Is that worth anything? Oh, that's the same as what we had before. All right, cool. It's just more of it. Good. I need, like, vendor trash that I can give to people to make money so I can buy a knife and, like, have basic adventuring tools. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We may be in a little bit of a situation. The good news is we just got better at mace fighting. Who's hitting me? Oh, a wolf. I don't know why wolves and spiders are cohabitating here. 
Uh, let's go ahead and evac real quick to the edges so that we can heal. And we'll grab some berries over here real fast. Honestly, I would say sleep. Uh, we're pretty beat up right now. All right, so now all healed up and rested up, we can head back into the fray, and I can kill off the rest of these spiders. Hopefully clear out the rest of the camp, find wherever the next treasure chest is, and make good use of that. Oh, God. Yeah, this is not great. There are more of them here than I like. Mmm... I can't decide if this is a, a running type sit. Yeah, this is a running type situation. Let's run. Let's flee. <laughs> I couldn't tell if this was like a heroism type situation or if this was like a run for your life type situation. Sometimes the two can kind of like blur together in unexpected ways. Uh, I've refilled my thirst, which is great, in this neighboring zone. We also got all our health back. So let me eat of the bounty of nature to get my meter back up, and we'll kind of like appraise. So I want the eye patch on, because that'll help out with apparently resisting death. That's what an eye patch does, it resists death. It looks like a feather adds dexterity to our gear. And we need to, I'm gonna start pumping endurance to get a little bit of extra HP. And I do wanna come back down here and finish off these spiders, dude. I don't feel good about the way things ended. The good news is, it's not as bad as it was at the beginning of the game, where I had no food and I was starving and just trying to figure out my way in the world. Now we've got a lot of food laying around, so we should be good. Let's start gathering spider webs over here, too. Each and every one is worth, like, 50 silver, so, like, it's not a bad idea to knock that out. Onslaught, you. How many more of you guys are over here? You're aggroed. For some reason, you're able to target yourself with your own abilities, and sometimes when you use the hotkeys, it just auto-hits yourself. Um, I don't know. I, maybe I'm misperceiving what happens, but sometimes it feels like I'm hitting myself with my own ability. All right, so I think we got them all. Now we just got to find this last treasure chest around here. No such luck on that last chest. I'm looking around trying to find it. I even checked on the world map, and it says that this is not plundered right here. Plundered means that you've gotten all the treasure chests and all the loots and stuff. Is that Wolf trying to fight me? I mean, I'll fight him if he wants to fight me. What you want to do, Wolf? Like, look at the look at the terror I have wrought on you, just for fun. I didn't even I didn't even need to do this. I just like did it. You know what I mean? There we go. Just, oh, that's why it said that it wasn't plundered. Is because there was one wolf left. That'll do it. I thought it said it was plundered because I've had it say that a location is plundered before just after I pick up the items out of the chest and leave without killing anybody. But that's pretty much the game as it stands right now. I mean, I, I think the complication happens where you need to start looking at every single location to figure out what jobs they have in those locations. So, like, if you want to get a spear you have to find a spear maker somewhere on the map. And so you gotta click on all these little settlements and try to like find it. I would definitely think about adding filters over here. So if each of these would get brighter and dim on out or get like a red X over the top of them or a green circle around them, or like, I guess just a red circle around them. Uh, if you could say, I need, you know, look for spear maker and then click on it. And then all the places that don't have a spear maker get an X over them. And the ones that do have a circle around them, I think that would be a really nice feature uh, for finding things in this game that would be helpful uh, but for our character what we would be looking for is we would be looking for a tool maker uh, so they've got an archery barracks over there these guys have hunters so we could chat them up about where we could go they have a bowyer okay over here they have a tailor over here they have a leather worker, they have a stonemason, they have a smelter, so that's good to know. We need to go over to that place if we want to smelt our ores, because we do have armor smithing skill. What is that, dune throwers? Huh. Interesting. There's a tool maker, so we would have to go on a pretty... We would have to go on a pretty long trek to get over there, but I think it would be worth it, and we could make an order from the blacksmith to make us a knife or something that we can dissect bodies with. The other thing we'd want to do is go to a leather worker and get a water skin or two or three. Uh, that way we don't have to worry about our water quite as much while we're cross countrying all over the place. But all in all, I like what I'm seeing here. I'm not a big fan of the coins that represent the characters and whatnot. It's a little low fi for me. 
But at the end of the day, I do play things like Unreal World, and that's honestly kind of the energy that I feel here. It feels kind of like somebody's making a medieval fantasy Unreal World meets something like Kenshi, uh, where you are capable of, like, building homes in this game. You're capable of having, uh, you know, heirs and people that take over when your character ages and dies from the places that we've seen them have, you know, training. Like, it said there was some kind of spear thrower or something over there. It feels like you're going to have the ability at some point uh, to, like, raise an army and possibly become some kind of, like, conqueror. Maybe you can go attack other locations and try to unify the realms and try to be the new king by force or something like that. It's kind of hard to speculate at the moment, but all in all, I liked what I played here today. I think it's going to be a little bit too unfocused and sandboxy for some people, for sure. Like, the same group of people that hit Kenshi and, like, bounce off of it. This is kind of that sort of game where it's like a little bit esoteric. You've got to sink into the world a little bit. You've got to kind of just like do stuff and wander around because this game gives you no guidance at the beginning. You spawn in town and that's it. You just start wandering around. And so it took me a while to kind of like get the gist of what this game is trying to be. But honestly, I think there's a big, big gap in the world of indies and video games in general. Uh, for wide open, just kind of player agency Kenshi style sandboxes. And so I'm glad to see another one with kind of that idea in mind. A game about mostly foraging and subsisting and just being like a normal person. But you can do some pretty awesome stuff if you want to. Uh, my name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to. The day up on the chopping block, we were taking a look at Soul Lash. I'm going to keep, a, I'm gonna keep a, a weather eye on this one. I think. I'm definitely interested to see where they go with it. I think it's a much more interesting game than the first game, since the first game was always constrained by being a murder hobo. But anyways, I'll catch y'all later. Thank you for stopping on by, and that's about all I got for you. Bye, folks.